That's the only slide you can put up. Just put that up. There we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 11. And good to see uh, folks still coming in here. And uh, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Revelation chapter 11. And we're going to look at the second half of this chapter. And we, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost, uh, tempted not to say it, but it shouldn't take as long tonight. We should not be here. Uh, <laughs> but we had a meeting of pastors today. There was like 15 of them here. And uh, one of the ladies from the Classical Conversations brought a pie, and she just wrote pastor pie on it. Of course, the guys that came all gave me grief about that. And they said, why does it say pastor pie? And they decided that it was because it had nuts on it. It was a little nutty. And, and it didn't know when to quit. That's what they, that was what they decided uh, that the pastor pie meant. So hopefully tonight uh, we'll be able to cover this in an effective way and, and thorough, but yet uh, perhaps won't take quite the full hour this evening. So let's read together the passage and then we'll pray. So Revelation chapter 11, verse. we're going to read 15 through verse, uh, verse 19, so the end of the chapter. Actually, let's back up and catch verse 14 says, the second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. The angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Let's pray together. Father, as we look again uh, to your letter of revelation to the church, Father, to show us, Father, the things that are, things that, uh, things that were, the things that are, and the things that shall be, uh, we thank you, Father, for this preview, as it were, of what it's going to be like, and I pray, God, as we endeavor to study through this in a systematic way, that you would guide our thoughts and give us understanding. When the text is plain and the meaning clear, may we accept it uh, by faith. But, Father, when it's difficult and we're not quite sure, may we have uh, humility and grace, um, humility with our own views and opinions, but grace with those that would differ with us. And so, God, we know that in the end, you know, there's only one view that matters, and that's your view. And so... I pray, God, for your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me as I speak, and may, um, may I speak words that are pleasing to you. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, this third woe and the blowing of the seventh trumpet, it's interesting that verse 14, the second woe has passed, and uh, the third woe is coming soon. Now, the first woe will be uh, back in chapter 9, or chapter 8, actually, we're at the end of chapter 8. Verse 13, this, this uh, eagle that was flying midair called out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. And so the next two trumpet blasts were the woes, the first two woes. And the first one there in chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, we studied this and so we won't go back over it. But it was these demonic, locust-like creatures that sweep the earth and torment uh, the people. The third woe, or the second woe, was uh, the, the trumpet of the sixth angel in verse 13 of chapter 9. And this was this, um, I'm sorry, the second woe, yeah, these demonic military horse like creatures that sweep the earth and they, and it's rather dramatic because it says they kill a third of, the, of mankind is going to be killed by um, this uh, smoke or the fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths in verse 18. And so those are rather traumatic, 
And yet when you get to verse 14, the second woe was passed, the third woe was coming, you're thinking, okay, while well, this trumpet blast is going to be a doozy, but the, the trumpet is sounded, but there's no judgment and there's no um, woe. There's no woe that comes forth. Why? Well, because there are some things that need to be seen before the judgment actually takes place. And I hope you'll appreciate the Lord for giving us kind of a preview of what's coming because the, the truth is the judgments and the woe of the seventh trumpet are actually the seven bowl judgments that begin in chapter 16 of Revelation that are by far much worse than any of the other judgments that have come upon the earth. And, and if you don't think so, just look at some of the descriptions that's given. Go ahead to chapter 16 and look what it says in verse 10 about the reaction after the fifth angel poured out his bowl. It says, men nod their tongues in agony and curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. It says, but they refused to repent of what they had done. This is just truly, it's almost beyond comprehension, even though the language is very clear. You can clearly see what's going on. And I've, I don't know that I've ever, I've, I've heard people curse. Uh, I've heard people, I've seen people that are angry, but I've never seen someone that's in so much pain mixed with anger that they literally are chewing on their tongues. They're making their tongues bloody uh, as they spew curses out towards God. And that's, that's not even the worst. The worst is still to come. Verse 21 of chapter 16 says, From the sky, huge hailstones of about 100 pounds eat. Now, I've been in some hailstorms, okay? And I've been in some various size hailstorms. I went to college in New Mexico, and I would drive from New Mexico to Indiana to see my folks once in a while, or even to Montana, my dad. But when I drive across Texas, I got caught in a hailstorm that I was underneath uh, uh, an interstate pass, and the vehicles kept piling up behind us all underneath the bridge trying to get out there. And me being, you know, as you would expect, the nice guy you all know and love. Yeah, I, uh, I kept edging out, and pretty soon the hail that was coming straight down all of a sudden was coming at a little more of an angle. And I, I literally was in the back seat of a, a 1980-something uh, uh, Delta 88 Royal. I love that car. And, uh, and I sat in the back seat of that wrapped up in a sleeping bag because I knew at any moment the windshield was going to give, and it was going to get pretty nasty for Mr. Mr. Foley setting up near somewhere in Texas. And, you know, if you're from Texas, I'm sorry, the, the best thing out of Texas is Interstate 35. That's what, you know, oh, all right, that's, that's mean, that's mean. I'm sorry about that. But nonetheless, I've seen some hail. I, I as a little boy, got caught out in a hailstorm trying to get to the house. We were sleeping out in the pole barn, and the hailstorm was coming so loud we could just the roar and, you know, a bunch of little boys, we all panicked. we got to get to the house. We should have just stayed right there. But we tried running to the house, and the hail was coming so bad that I turned around and was backing up to the house, and we had one on an old telephone pole that was down, and I tripped over it, and the hail was pelting me in the face, and we got into the house, you know, and, and lesser boys would have been crying. No, actually, I was crying. And, uh, you know, and so, so I've been in some little pelting hail, things like that. Imagine a 100-pound hailstorms, just the the abject fear that would come across you as you see these things banging on the ground and hitting near you. And wow. And yet, look what it says. From the sky, these huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell upon men. And it says, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. They knew God was doing it. They knew what was up. And in spite of their fear, they were just cursing God even as punishment and judgment was coming down on them. So these uh, seven, these bold judgments of Revelation 16 uh, and, and further, just are, they are terrible, but they are also the climax of human history and really the end of time as we know it. But before we get there, as we just stated, there's some things that apparently God wants us to see and, the understand, and to understand. And the first is that this overview of events that are yet to take place in the book of Revelation. 
And this present passage, verses 15 through the end of the chapter, are, are, uh, it kind of leaps us ahead and it shows us in what you might call a broad summary of what is going to happen over the next 10 chapters of this great book, as well as introducing uh, the primary characters of this divine drama. So God prepared John's heart for these terrible events. And now remember also that John was writing the things that God was showing to him. So we read them, and those of us that enjoy reading a lot, you know, our imaginations work well, and we can picture these things. But John saw them. They, John had an eyewitness history, or an eyewitness account of the future history of humanity, and this had to be dreadful for John to take all of this in and to see it all. And so God, I think in His, in his grace and His love, he shows John that man, there's, God is going to ultimately triumph over evil. God is going to establish His kingdom forever. And He began with the end in view. Now, if, if any of you that are slightly fearful when you're either reading or watching a movie, have you ever skipped ahead to the end to read to make sure everybody's okay and then you go back and read it and enjoy it because you're not... Anybody else I was going to say? Apparently, I'm the only one uh, that does that. There are some times that I get so scared watching things. I know it sounds silly, but I'm... Yeah. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about, let's talk about your sins this evening and not some of my... Yeah, it's not a sin. It's a failing, though. I get so scared. And so I'm so glad that God put this in here so that we don't, we don't, uh, we don't see it. So it unfolds for us in four scenes in this, uh, the end of this chapter. And scene one is... Verse 15, the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of God. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, those plural, which said, the kingdom of the world has become... And why the plural voices? What does the scripture say about the mouth of two or three witnesses? Every matter is established. That's the only thing I can think of. Why would there need to be voices instead of just one angelic announcement? Well, there's unity... In, in heaven over what's going to happen. And so it's voices plural that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ and He will reign forever and ever. Now, how many of you cannot hardly wait for that time? I mean, even so, come Lord Jesus. Come now. Is anybody else ready for the Lord to take charge of this miserable place where you know, I mean, it is a mess out there, and it's getting worse. And I'm so ready for a kingdom to be established. That's the Lord, and it says of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. I like how Paige Patterson writes, or describes it. He says, unlike the first six trumpets, which are the harbingers of six judgments, the sound of the seventh trumpet peels back the veil of heaven. And introduces the reader to a heartening announcement. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And He will reign forever and ever. I like John Walvoord. He writes this. The fact that this will be fulfilled at the second coming makes it clear that the period of the seventh trumpet chronologically reaches to Christ's return. And at the conclusion of these judgments, my friends, um, the kingdom of this world, and again, uh, repeated a third time, will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And, and notice, our, and He will reign forever and ever. And I want to just say, this is not a definitive passage in this regard, but to me, it affirms the fact that John is not describing um, a partial reign of the Lord in this regard. Um, I at one time was more of an amillennialist in my understanding of the book of Revelation. And my understanding was that these events were describing historical events that had already taken place and that there's no literal thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth, but rather Jesus is reigning now. And, and I would say, as my teachers taught me, well, he's reigning in the hearts of believers because people would look and say, well, it doesn't seem like he's reigning very well. And, you know, our answer was always, well, he's reigning in the hearts of, of, of his people. And that's what I used to say uh, until I finally 
had to even be honest with myself, that verse 15 doesn't say that the kingdom of the believers that already love Jesus has become the kingdom. It says the kingdoms of the world. Not There's no limit there. Um, he will reign forever and ever. There's a definitive statement of His sovereignty and His control and His rule and His reign. And I just, um, I just could no longer hold to that view and, and think and I began to view this book as more future, you know, describing events that will take place. The fact of one day Jesus Christ reigning, and again, it's on the earth, it's in this world, it's not heaven that is where Jesus reigns, it's the world, and so that that is clear. Uh, let, let's look in a few passages, Luke chapter 1, let's start with, with the announcement concerning Jesus and who He would be, and what um, what the angel told Mary about Jesus and about the extent of His rule. It says in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to go to Daniel chapter 2 after that, and we'll eventually hit Zechariah 14. But in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 30, you will be a child and will give birth to a son, and you're to give Him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. It says the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David, and He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Look with me, if you will, back to the book of Daniel. Go to Daniel. And if you get to Lamentations and Ezekiel, you've gone too far. If you're at Hosea, keep going. Next book over to your left. Daniel chapter... Oh, let's start in chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I always like to help folks out by telling you that that is on page 1,122 of my Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't help at all, does it? Yeah. Uh, look what it says uh, in verse, <coughs> verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. And I think there's a, there's a totality there that you can't really hold to in, in a spiritual understanding of His kingdom. But it's actual, literal. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34 Verse 30, 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My sanity was restored. Oh, wow, what a, what a deal he had. Um, yeah, he thought he was something, and he wasn't, and God kind of drove him crazy, and he went out there, and he, yeah, at any rate, uh, that's not the part of the story we want to look at. It says, then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. And that's what he says, his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and with the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? In other words, his authority, his rule, his reign will be unquestioned. And right now it's questioned by everyone, um, including some that say they're Christians. Uh, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 26 says, I issued a decree, this is King Darius, says in, that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. Look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. Daniel's vision here. And that in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with clouds, with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one 
that will never be destroyed. One more, uh, Daniel 7, well, well, one more in Daniel. Uh, verse 26, but all the court will sit and his power will be taken away as, and completely destroyed forever. That's, that's boy, that's uh, Satan's blasphemous leader, this one that oppresses the saints. He's destroyed forever. Verse 27, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey Him. Again, there's a, there's a completeness there that simply doesn't carry to simply say, oh, well, Jesus is reigning now in the hearts of people. No, it says here that when He takes the throne, when He takes the kingdom, it says all rulers will worship and obey Him. Not some, not those that are believers, but all. Let's go to Zechariah. If you get to Haggai, the next book, if you get to Malachi, you've gone one too far. It's actually not pronounced Malachi. I'm just trying to see if you knew that. Malachi, yeah, you've gone too far. Zechariah 14, verse 9. I'm waiting. I love pages flipping. It's good for us to read our Bibles and to know these things and look at them our eyes. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and His name. Boy. I've, I've got that highlighted in my Bible. Because <laughs> I can't wait for that. Yeah. That's really what I think that's why I love Studying the book of Revelation, I know there's stuff in there I don't understand. There's stuff in there that I pretend I understand. I'm probably not right completely on it. And uh, and I know sometimes people that maybe are smarter than I shaking their heads as I'm preaching, going, poor guy, poor guy. But hey, I love it because it's encouraging to me when I read the end of the book and know that we win. Uh, one author writes this. Let me see if I, I didn't write his name down. Um, but I wrote it. So one author. Just think, he says, utopia is, I think this is uh, Barclay. Utopia is coming to earth. Peace and prosperity are coming. There will no longer be hunger, thirst, homelessness, disease, war, murder, nor any of the other evils upon the earth. But note, utopia will only come when Jesus Christ returns to rule the earth. Man fails and fails miserably in his attempt to clean up the world and to establish peace. But God loves man and loves him dearly. Therefore, he is going to help man. God is going to send his dear son back to, the earth, back to earth to establish peace and prosperity for all. God is going to do for man what man has so miserably failed to do. This is the glorious promise of this passage. And I remember who it was just from reading. It was Dr. David Hawking. Folks, that's the, that's the beauty of that first scene, that Jesus rules, Jesus wins. Um, he's going to reign forever and ever. Scene number two was the worship of the Lord Almighty. Um, it says in verse, uh, verses 16 and 17, and the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. It's just going to be such a, a glorious event that these guys are going to fall on their faces. They're, they're, they worship Him, just to get detailed, they, they worship Him for three things. They praise God as the Lord God Almighty, the Lord, the Curie. He's the, the Lord and the Master, the ruler of all lives. He is Theos. He is Jesus is God. He's the Creator. He's the Maker of it all. He uh, is the only one deserved to be worshipped. And He is Almighty. The Almighty One. And that literally the word means all strength. He's omnipotent. He can do anything and He will always be able to execute His will. And to have the Master, to have the God that loves us, to have the One that is Almighty in charge, I'm just, I am ready. I am ready. 
And they praised Him, not just for who He was, but it says, the one who is and who was. I mean, just the totality of, of who He is. We give thanks to You, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was. And again, what does that mean? Well, it's, He's eternal. He is the one existing now, but He's always existed. The Lord God possesses life forever, ever, and He is able to give life to those whom He will. That's why Revelation 1.8 describes Him, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who, was, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so they praise Him for being the Lord God Almighty, for being the Eternal One. They also praise Him for taking His power back from the world and beginning to reign in His rightful place. And He will reign forever. The end of verse 15 says, here it says, we praise you because you have taken, the end of verse 17, you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And that's kind of fascinating when you think about it because God, in essence, has allowed Satan to have access to the world, to man. He's allowed man, humanity, to have free will, to choose whether or not to love him or serve him. And then, unfortunately, for the most part, uh, man has chosen to follow Satan instead of God. And that's just evidence of that everywhere we look. And the result is, if you'll look with me in Romans chapter 3, is that we have a world that is uh, governed mostly and predominantly by a mass of people who, who deny and ignore God. They do everything they can to pretend that God is not. And they fulfill the description that was written of them 2,000 years ago when Paul says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And this world is indeed so wrecked by sin and evil that... Um, Many of the problems that mankind faces today are simply beyond solving. Um, they're like, uh, if you've ever been fishing, and you those those little Zebco reels we used to use, some of you probably still use them, but you know, every now and then you cast and your bait doesn't go out and you pop it open and there's just this bird's nest mess right there. And, and you set down, if you don't have any other fishing line, you're destined to sit there for the next two hours trying to sort that all out. But if you're wise, what do you do? Snip, throw it away, and get back to fishing, right? And so, and I, I learned to fly fish. That was exciting, except when it wasn't. You know, when you're sitting over on the bank and you're trying to retie your leader and get it all. Yeah, yeah some things are just, uh, they're just beyond. I, I had a friend and, he got crossways with the leadership of the church and, and very angry and didn't know how to resolve it. And Maybe a year or two later I met with him again and he wanted to meet and I was so excited because I thought, oh, wow, we get a fresh start, we get to start over and just go on. And we, we started having lunch together and the first thing he said, well, now let's go back because I want to go back over and I was like, oh, no, no, we cannot, we can't untangle that mess. Because he was trying to tell me why people did stuff. I said, you don't know why people did stuff. You can make a guess, but you don't know. Yes, I do. No, you don't. You know, I just, oh, I, I broke my heart. You know, because there's some, and, and I, I broke my heart because of the mess, okay? Because I'm, I'm not sinless in those types of messes. I, I'm just as sinful as everybody else. And we make such a mess of things and we can't fix them, we can't solve them. And man, and, uh, wow, I don't even know why I mentioned all that. It just, it just when I started thinking about how wicked man is and, and I started thinking about, oh yeah, we, we can start talking about the world out there, how wicked they are. But then pretty soon we have to look at our own hearts and say, you know what, save for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd be right there in the midst of them, I'm right in the middle of it. And, and I'm saved by grace and forgiven by God, and yet I still find myself in some messes of, of you know, Didi's making, or I mean, of my, of my making. And, you know, we all, we, we all still are right there at times, right? And, man, 
to try to sort stuff out and why did I do that? I don't know why I did that. You know, and then somebody else is trying to tell me why I did something. That's brilliant. I can't, you can't even say why you do stuff, but you're an expert on somebody else. Why they, you know, it's just, a, it's just this constant mess, right? And we can't sort it out. But I'm looking forward to when Jesus comes because he will sort it all out, right? <laughs> For one thing, when all things become new, and when we get to heaven, we see how glorious it is, and we're going to all know, know, know that we don't deserve to be there. And so we're not going to look around at somebody else and go, what are you doing here? Because, you know what I'm saying? It's not going to be like that at all. And, uh, boy, we... Whew. But here's a promise. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die... He, oh, you're really full of joy tonight, Pastor. Thank you for... Telling you, you're going to die, okay? Right? In Adam all die. But look what it says. Comma, so in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits. And look what it says. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then, the end will come. Notice the progression. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when he says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself. He put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him and put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Man. He's going he's gonna to judge this world and it's all coming back to his authority and that's why these angels fall down and worship him. Scene three. Not such a good scene. Okay. In any drama, there's a... But this isn't a made-up drama. This is what's going to happen. Verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come. Wow, I, you know, um, this scene three is the final rebellion of the nations. Now, I nearly called this the settling of all scores. But I wasn't sure if a reference from the Godfather would be appropriate in this particular setting. But yet, more than just a statement about the dispensing of judgment, justice, our, if our passage is a summary of all that is to come, and I believe it is so, then this is the picture of the future events that are laid out in Revelation chapter 20. But back to verse 18, the nations were angry. You know, have you ever looked at your newscast and TV or listened to the radio and and just had this thought cross through your mind. Why are people so mad at God? Why are they so angry? You, you, people screaming and, you know, distortion and rebellion and fist in the face and doing everything they can. If God says something's this way, they're saying, no, it isn't. It's that. Up is down and down is up and wrong is right and right is wrong and White is black and black is white. And I'm not talking about race. I'm just talking about just a rejection and a denial even of reality itself. And there's an anger that is out there in the nation. Angry at God. Angry at God for not giving them what all they want even though whenever they get what they want they're never satisfied. They always want more. The, the people that get everything they think they want are usually the most miserable people on the planet. They... They just find no peace, even whether they're without or whether they're with or in all stages in between. There's just a big mess. And everybody, ultimately down, it boils down to they're mad at God. And I remember that because it helps me when I look around and go, man, what is your deal? What's wrong with you? Well, they're just mad at God. That doesn't change their destiny. Because the nations were angry, it says, and your wrath has come. 
The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, the saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. So the, the things that, that are laid out here is the final rebellion against God. And that's, let's look ahead because that's what this is. It's kind of a snapshot. It's kind of like that little map that they give you when you arrive at, at, um, at, a, at a place in a national park and you're about to go see some exhibit and somebody will hand you a little map and it shows you where it's and the little story behind it. That's what this is. It's kind of a little picture of what's coming. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle in number they are like sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people in the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Well, there's also the wrath that has come. Your wrath, back to Revelation 12, 11, says your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead. And again, that's seen in Revelation 20. Again, verse 9 Fire coming down from heaven, devouring them. The devil, verse 10, who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then, of course, the final judgment of all, of, of reward and also for judgment for those. That, and I love this statement, for rewarding your servants, the prophets. There, there is, you know, this notion that somehow we're all going to be the same in heaven and we're all going to have equal... No, it doesn't say that at all. There's rewards in heaven for service. You know, and, and I'm not suggesting that you're going to get to heaven and go, aw, shucks, you know, that's not... I don't think that's going to be the case. But there is, there is rewards. There's going to be honors. There's those that reverence your name, your saints, the sanctified ones, those that are set apart, your servants, the prophets, those that speak your word. Um, small and great, the well-known, the Billy Grahams, and then the Jay Foley's. We're all going to get a reward. We're all going to be rewarded for what we do. You teach a class, you speak God's Word, you tell people what God has to say, you're going to be rewarded. And that's, I don't think that's wrong to think about that. Um, verse, in this final judgment, again back to Revelation 20, uh, here it's described in detail, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, small, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. Uh, the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Wow. Sea gave up the dead that were in them. Death and Hades gave up the dead that was in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. You said, wait a minute, I thought we were saved by grace. Yes, you're saved by grace. You're going to be in heaven because of what Jesus did. But you're going to be judged by what you do when you get there. Because there is a judgment for rewards. And uh, your name, if your name is in the book of life, you're going to be, you're saved. But you're still going to give an account for what you did. And that terrifies me at times. Because I know what the Bible says about teachers. Teachers are going to receive a more strict judgment than you are. The scene four. Let's end on a good note here, verse 19. And that is God's temple is open. And it just says, then God's temple in heaven was open. <laughs> now, why is that important? Well, because of what it goes on to say. And within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Wow. Wait a minute. You mean that thing that we saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yep. Yep. And it's no, it's not in heaven. It's not in con. It's not in yeah. It's not in Washington somewhere in a warehouse. You know, being starred. No, no, it's in heaven. And it's interesting all the stories about people trying to find the ark. Where is it at? It's in heaven. By the way, uh, I understand also what Scripture teaches about the things here on earth being mirrors or copies of the heavenly realities. This is the real ark of the covenant. I think it's the actual. Ark of the Covenant. And again, I want to give you some guys smarter than I. Paige Patterson writes this. The appearance of the Ark in heaven is particularly important because the Ark was the symbol of the promises of God. Remember what was in it? The two tablets of the law? 
uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and a pot of the manna. A pot of them, what is it? What's that? You, you will finally get to know what it is. I think it's going to be daylight donuts. Well, okay, maybe for sure an apple fritter. No, <laughs> no, no, I don't know. It's 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 some donut somehow. I know that because that's just too heavenly, right? Okay, yeah. But the ark was. I, I James Patterson didn't write all that. By the way, that was me. All right, the promises of God. It was a symbol of the promises of God, and particularly the mercy seat. You know, I'm thinking of the contents, but remember the angels with their wings stretched out over the mercy seat which was the focus of the ritual of the Day of Atonement, which foreshadowed the ultimate atonement of Christ. To the Jewish mind, the Ark of the Covenant with the Holy of Holies was where God uniquely dwelled. They recognized the omnipresence of God, but also believed that in some unique way He, dealt, he dwelt in the Holy of Holies and manifested Himself in His promises to Israel. Now the Ark of the Covenant, symbolizing both the promises of God available in his divine providences is seen in heaven, end quote. Now, William Barclay, he has an interesting comment, and it's similar, but look what it says. The temple is open, but there's more than that. The Ark of the Covenant is seen. Now the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies, the inside of which no ordinary person had seen, and into which even the high priest went only on the Day of Atonement. This vision involves the opening up of the temple. And the opening up of the Holy of Holies. This can only have one meaning. It must mean that now, in this time, at this fulfillment, the glory of God is going to be on full display. That which was secret is going to be revealed. That which no man has seen is going to be open in the sight of all men. The full glory of God is going to burst upon men. Why the special reference to the Ark of the Covenant? This is to remind people of God's special covenant with His own people. Originally, that covenant had been within the, with the people of Israel, but the new covenant is with the covenant in Jesus Christ and with all of every nation who love and believe in Jesus. This means that in the full display of God's glory and the destruction of God's enemies, listen to what he says, God will remember His covenant and God will be true to His own. Whatever terror, whatever the destruction to come, God will not break His covenant that He made with His people and will not be false to His promises. So this picture is a picture of the coming of the full glory of God, which is a terrifying threat to the enemies of God, but an uplifting promise to the people of the covenant. Amen? Amen. Father, thank You for giving us this beautiful picture of your victory and I know it's going to be described even in greater detail as we go but thank you for the snapshot and for the encouragement that it brings for the anticipation that it brings not that any of us are looking forward to the judgment and destruction of the wicked the death of the wicked none of us want that um, Father may we have your heart that desires all, all people to come to Christ to be saved and so, Father, between now and then, may we do everything in our power to reach those that are lost and to tell them about Jesus. May we invite people to place their faith and their trust in your only Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, next week, Dee Dee and I will be gone. I'm going to be doing a wedding for... Uh, a friend who's a pastor